everyone, my name is Holly and I'm the Assistant Librarian of Programming and Marketing here at the National Public Library. Thank you for coming to our last election forum of the year, this one for the Board of Education. We're glad that you're here. Thank you to National Public Television for live streaming and recording tonight's program. You'll be able to watch the recording on Channel 6 on Comcast or at brbtv.live tomorrow. Thank you also to the League of Women Voters of New Hampshire, our partners for this nonpartisan event. They do so much thoughtful <coughs> prep work for this entire election forum series, and we're truly grateful for all their hard work. Thank you. Now let me turn things over to Mike Appleberg, tonight's forum moderator. <clears throat> Good evening. Welcome, everybody. My name is Mike Appleberg. I'll be moderating this evening's forum. I'm the president of the United Way of Greater Nashua. Um, we have a very full audience, a full packed uh, table up here today, eight candidates. We thank you all for coming and making the time to speak with the public. Um, we are taking questions from the audience. We are, we do have a lot of questions here already. I'm going to say that we have a hard deadline of about the next five minutes or so if you'd like to have a question asked. At some point during the forum, we'll try and get to that. Uh, please just raise your hand and one of the volunteers from League of Women Voters will come over and give you a card to write out your question. We'll try to get to that. A few rules for our candidates this evening. We're going to ask that any of your responses, including opening remarks, including closing remarks, and including responses to questions be kept to a maximum of one minute. That's to allow everybody the time to uh, participate fully. We would ask that you do not interrupt one another at any time for any, for any reason. Um, you, there might be an opportunity for a rebuttal to an answer, but if that is, courtesy is granted, that'll be solely at my discretion. So please don't expect that as, as a right of participation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over and we're just going to simply go straight down the line for an introduction from each of you for one minute to please introduce yourself to the good people of Nashua. Thank you very much. We'll start with Ms. Hohenzey. Good evening. I'm Doris Hohenzey. I was on the board from 2019 or 16 to 19. So I've been on the board. I've got some experience. I enjoyed my time there serving the public and I'm looking to serve again. My main goals are transparency and to serve constituents. And by transparency, I don't just mean find information for me as a member of the board but also to give it to parents and for administrators to help us understand how we are overseeing the district. The transparency has to come from every different direction so we can serve the constituents and help them feel part of our district and know what's going on and try to eliminate this feeling that parents are afraid to come forward and speak up, but that's gotta go. So that's why I'm running. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Owensay. Next, Ms. Daniels-Williams. Hi, thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Um, my name is Shawanda Daniels Williams and I am running because I want to be service of service to my community. I want to support um, the teachers and staff at our public schools. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Bishop. Thank you. My name is Jennifer Bishop. I am running for re-election onto the Board of Education. First off, I want to say thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting this panel. It's going to be very interesting to see what everybody has to say. I um, wanted to let you know I'm a mom of two students in the district. I'm also a social worker in Nashville for the last about 20 years, so I'm pretty familiar with the area resources and, and what is available um, to everybody. Um, I'm currently dedicated to supporting students and staff in public schools, which is paramount to a healthy and progressive community. I want to continue to expand the opportunity students have to explore their careers, gain real-world experience, and enhance their quality of academics. When we help students mature into adults they're proud of, we bolster our community. I want to continue to advocate for teacher and staff needs and ensure the correct <coughs> resources are available. Our teachers and paras are the cornerstone of our educational system and deserve the tools and professional development that will fortify their already quality work. It is important for me to continue to advocate for and ensure access to these resources. Thank you, Ms. Bishop. Next, Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for having us here tonight. My name is Paula Johnson. I'm a current member of the Board of Education. A little background on myself. In 20 to 2001, I was on the Board of Education. In 2002, 2005, I was an alderman at large. 2005 to 2006, I was a state representative. And in 2020, I was reelected to the Board of Education. And I thank everybody 
for the re-election. I am experienced, I'm a fiscal conservative, capable of long-standing advocate, and I'm here for the students and will represent them. I also feel that parents have to have more rights in the schools. We need to have the community to come out and work with us as a team, because teamwork makes the dream work for our students. I'm also here, and I want to be reelected because I'd like to go on with the redistricting and see what's going to happen with Mount Pleasant. I think it's going to take a full board, and we need to really elect the incumbent, three incumbents, so that we can work as a group to continue what we have started. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Ms. Prynne. Hi. Uh, my name is Kirsten Prynne. I'm running for the Board of Election, uh, Board of uh, Education, sorry. <laughs> I'm a little tired today. Uh, I'm running because I have dedicated my life to education. I'm one of those people that when I was in the second grade, I knew I wanted to be a teacher. It's important to me. It, education for me personally has brought me out of poverty. And I think education is the key to success in life. And I want to support our schools here in Nashua, the families, the students, and the teachers. Uh, if we can work together, I think the schools will just keep going forward, and I want to be a part of that. Thank you very much. And Mr. Johnson. Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Rob Johnson. I'm running for Board of Education. I uh, have two students at Nashua South, a junior and senior. I also uh, have worked with kids as a coach in uh, football and basketball. And um, running for board to open communication between parents and teachers and students, I don't feel like they should be left out of the discussion on plans for their education. And, uh, I have experience with the PTO at New Searles for seven years, and I used to be a college administrator where I started peer programs um, for students. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Ms. Giglio. Hi. Um, I'm running for re-election to the board. Um, I started my career in education as a parent volunteer at New Searles School um, and went from there to be a para for four and a half years and then decided I wanted to be a school librarian. So I went back to school and got my master's degree. I have over 30 years in public education altogether. I've lived here for 39 years. I have two adult children who got a wonderful education here. I have one grandchild who's currently in the schools. Um, I want to continue to keep safe and support our diverse students and staff in all of their educational needs. I think my record of the last four years speaks for itself. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Giulio. And last but not least, Ms. Whitaker. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you, League of Women Voters, for having us all here. This is an amazing opportunity to let you all know what I'm thinking. And as a mother of three and a former district employee, I believe I can provide a fresh new perspective involving all the upcoming decisions the board will have to be part of. I plan to help parents, teachers, and students navigate some of the confusing things that we have going on in our system. When we talk about transparency, maybe some of these parents need help breaking down what we're doing, more information on where the meetings are, and I wanna open up that line of communication for our, com our community. Um, um, I wanna be part of the decisions um, that may directly or indirectly affect my children or other people's children and staff. Um, I'm a member of the community and I want to continue to serve. Thank you very much to each of you for your introductions. We appreciate that. Now, I'm gonna try to ask a couple of questions that will give everybody the chance to, to chime in. Um, and seeing how that goes, we might end up bouncing around a little bit. So everybody might not get every question, but we're gonna start out and see how does that work. So I'm just gonna start down at the, um, well, I'm not going to start with Ms. Whitaker since um, she's being rewired. Is, is, her, is your sound good? Okay, very good. So we'll start with Ms. Whitaker again. And we're just going to work our way back, if you don't mind. Yeah. And I want to talk a little bit about workforce. We all know that um, New Hampshire struggles with workforce. And we also know that it's difficult to find and retain good educators. So the first question from the audience, is, I'm just going to read exactly, is what can be done to hire, retain, and develop teachers and staff in our school district. And I'll let Ms. Whitaker, if you could start the conversation. Okay, thank you for that question, audience members. That's one of my, the important topics that I 
find concerning. And I don't personally have all the ideas to bring in new staff and hold them in our district. But I do know that our senior staff members that are already there should be working as um, mentors to the new and incoming staff that are navigating our new systems, new curriculums, and students in their different ways. So I would, for me to answer that question, I would love to hear the ideas of other people on how, even um, staff members that are there now, how can, how can we serve you better? Okay, thank you very much for your answer. Ms. Giglio, same question. Okay, um, <clears throat> that's one of the top three challenges I think that we face going forward the next few years. Um, I've been on the um, HR committee, I've been the chair of the HR committee for the, the Board of Education. Um, we've done a lot of interviewing over the last few years, mostly for administrative positions, but we approve all the hires. And um, I think what we need to do is make sure that our teachers are getting the pay and the benefits that are equal to what everyone around them is getting. Um, and I think that we need to point out our exemplary teachers and give them rewards um, to retain them. Um, and um, I think, I know that we have a shortage, um, but our shortages right now, at least of powers, is probably half of what it was a year ago. And I'm hoping that all of us being here tonight and speaking might inspire people to want to come. I started as a power, and here I am on the Board of Education. So. It's great. Thank you very much. Mr. Johnson, what can be done to hire, retain, and develop teachers and staff in the school district? I think um, we should really look at the teachers we do have and discuss with those teachers what keeps them in Nashua and what makes them want to teach here. Um, because we can really learn from that of how we can apply that to new hires and how we can say, hey, listen, you know, this person is teach here, taught here for X number of years. Let's bring them in. They can tell you what's appealing about the uh, working in the Nashua school system. Um, also, we should see what students think, uh, what teachers they like, what draws them to a teacher, especially when they get to that high school level and they have that personal connection with the teacher. What makes them, what do they look for in a teacher? Okay, thank you very much. Ms. Prynne? Uh, right now, I don't think it's just happening in New Hampshire. All over the country, teachers are leaving the profession. Uh, I know this as someone who has lost many colleagues because of the feelings of not being appreciated or being respected as an educator. We need to support educators. We need to you know, hire and retain good people. We need to give them the tools that they need to be able to teach well in the classroom. and. And, and support them, not micromanage them, but support them so that they can you know, teach successfully in the, in the classroom. Um, they need to have science-based <coughs> curriculum. They need to be you know, paid competitively uh, and, and treated with respect so that they don't want to leave. Thank you very much. Ms. Johnson? Thank you very much. I think this is kind of twofold. Number one, how do we keep and remain, retain teachers? How do we bring teachers more into the district here? Where you have a housing shortage and the cost of housing is so high, we have to make sure that we can bring them in and they can afford to live in Nashua because we bought a Massachusetts and a lot of teachers, you know, Massachusetts pay more, of course, they're gonna to wanna to go where the pay is. You have to have a good system here. You have to have a good superintendent, good super, assistant superintendents, and you have to be able to have coaches when you need them to work with the teachers. You have to have good curriculums. And once you have all that together, it's a good formula. But again, the cost of housing is a lot that depends on can people come to Nashua and afford to live here in this city. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Ms. Bishop. I don't think there's much more I can add from what everybody's already said. We need to pay our teachers um, accordingly. We need to offer them the resources and development that they need. And we need to celebrate them for the hard work that they do and the enhancement of the lives of our children that we have. I know my kids have benefited greatly from the teachers that have exposed them to education and we have to continue to celebrate them and honor them and pay them accordingly. Thank you. And by the way, anybody who wants to say that I don't have anything to add, that's a perfectly legitimate answer and will save us a little time. So we appreciate that. Um, Ms. Daniels-Williams? I don't have anything to add. Perfect. Thank you. Ms. Owens. Thank you. 
I think it's, well, if I was a teacher, what would I want? I would want to work with a team. I think we should set up teams within the school. So you have mentorship within your team. You've got support within your team. You develop a rapport so you, when you're coming to work, you, you've got a team you're working with. It's not just this big school. And more feedback to the board. So the board understands what the problems are so we can anticipate and help them. And hopefully, let them be innovative. Let them. Let them be independent enough, thinking enough, so they can try some things and that maybe they work. Because I think we respect our teachers, we respect their training, and respect that they have the ability to, to go forward with sometimes with new ideas. Thank you very much. So the next question I'm going to ask, um, I'm only ask half of the panelists so that we get a little bit of extra because I think that's probably going to happen again. We're, Enough has been said, it's all been said, but so this one we'll start with Ms. Print and we'll just work our way down from there, okay? So this is about um, consolidation of schools and redistricting. I had several questions come from the audience on that. One was, is consolidation inevitable? The other I will read is, if elected, will you request the Board of Aldermen to rehabilitate and reconstruct Mount Pleasant Elementary School to keep it going for the future of the children in our community? And I think that can be broadened to talk about um, your thoughts on redistricting in general. So we'll start with Ms. Sprint and then work our way down. Okay. Uh, so it's funny. I don't honestly know everything there is about the, what might happen through redistricting with Mount Pleasant. I am aware that enrollment is low there. The irony for me is that I've actually been through redistricting. And the school that I worked in was a beautiful building. We were pre-K through grade two school. And they kept telling us the building needed to be shut down because it's old and it's terrible. And so we got from first and second grade in kindergarten, we got redistricted in, in my district and they kept the pre-K program there. And 10 years later, that building is still open. I, because of the fact that we still have high numbers and I, I know that in other buildings here in Nashua, the numbers are high. So I would hope we could come forth with a plan where instead of closing the school down, we could redistrict so that we can even out the numbers in the schools more equitably. Thank you very much. Mr. Johnson. Uh, two things. Redistricting is going to be important. We have schools that have too many kids and schools that have too few kids. And we really have to figure out a way to balance that out. Um, I would hate to see any school closed. Uh, my school that I went to up to third grade was closed and it was not good. It was hard for the community, hard for the students, hard for the teachers. And we don't want to have to go through that. Schools are a very important part of community, and that's what we have to remember. Um, the community of that school, Mount Pleasant, wants to keep their school. So we have to really try and work with them to keep that going for that community. Thank you. Ms. Giulio? Hi. Um, we, were, we were tasked with redistricting um, on the board because we needed to redistrict um, the middle schools because we're opening a new middle school. And at the same time, we also looked at the possibility of redistricting the elementary schools. Um, I felt that we rushed the process a little and that I felt like we needed more time and that we needed more input by the staff and the people who are working in the schools um, about what, are, what we should look at for redistricting and also needed to pay attention to the needs of each different school. Um, closing a school should always be the last option, um, but I, I do believe that um, we as a group can, can look at the redistricting and come up with a better plan than what we were looking at a few months ago. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Whitaker. So <clears throat> redistricting is definitely something that has come up a lot because it's going to affect people um, positively, maybe some neighborhoods negatively. I'm just piggybacking off of Rob Johnson when it comes to community and the importance of community in these certain areas that are in Nashua. So I feel that it's important to keep all of our schools open. Um, personally, I have a middle schooler that will be redistricted did to a different school um, next year and I'm not sure how he's gonna feel about that starting in one school and then moving to another but that's something for the future that's something that we can see I'm not afraid of change however I just want everybody to be on board with those changes so that um, our community is comfortable our children are comfortable thank you very much uh, we had a couple of questions that were related um, in that they 
addressed both technology and cheating. And I was hoping that uh, maybe this side of the room can now work these questions. So <laughs> that's not, that's nothing in that. Don't read anything into that. So we'll start with Ms. Johnson and work our way back. Um, the first was, and you, and you could address both of these if you want, the, the first was with the rise of artificial intelligence. Um, and I think the question is really asking about items like chat GPT, specifically as a resource that can be abused by students and foster cheating, what are your thoughts on ways to control this abuse? And the second question was, given that multiple states have banned cell phones in schools, what is your thought on banning cell phones in Nashua schools during instructional times? Can I take second part? You can take either of them. <laughs> I like the redistricting one better. Oh, no, you can't have that one. That <laughs> one's gone. I can't have that one. Okay. Sorry, that one's gone. That one's gone. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the cell phones in schools sure. because, you know, I get it. We all live by our cell phones now. Without our cell phones, phones, we're toast, I think, already. As a matter of fact, I think I left my cell phone in the car this evening, so I don't have it here. I don't have to answer it. In the classroom, I can understand using it if you have a math problem, if you need something like that. But really, in the classroom, those cell phones really need to be silenced, shut off, and be, pay attention to the instruction because we, don't, we, we have the teachers in the classroom we're, we're teaching, but cell phones is a distraction. And we all know it's a big distraction because if I have my cell phone here right now, what would I be doing? Probably checking it out to see if anybody's calling me, anybody's sending me a text. And that's not the purpose of our students in the classroom. They're there to learn. And they should not have it on during instruction time. Before class starts or after class, that's fine, but not during instruction time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Bishop. So I think the use of AI is, is a complicated one right now mm -hmm. because it can be used as a tool just like we used to do with Word with the squigglies under the words and you could figure out what's going on. But it's developed into this thing where you can actually write reports based on certain pieces of information. I think when a teacher has a concern that maybe there has been some um, cheating or you know, wrong use of resources, um, ask the students how they're showing their work. How are you getting to this answer? It's, it's a hard thing for people to prove at this point. Um, sorry, I got distracted with the, with the waving. Um, but I think our instructors are going to have to look into how we're going to be monitoring this and using it in a positive way, um, but also how we can continue to encourage students to think critically and use um, the resources available to them, but also um, think independently. Thank you very much. By the way, I did ask the person who wrote that question if they used chat GPT to write that question. <laughs> <clears throat> they did not say yes. Ms. Daniels-Williams. So when it comes to technology and our kids, they have been taught how to use it. I believe that if it com when it comes down to AI and um, writing the reports, um, just like Ms. Bishop said, I think that it's, it's up to the teacher to engage them to see how they came to that answer. That I don't think um, it is something that will always be abused. It always could be, but it's not something that will be indefinitely abused. Um, when it comes to the cell phones, I think that um, our children are... Um, Again, very used to technology, and they go by the rules of the teachers in the classroom. Um, and a lo lot of my students aren't allowed to have them during the instructional time. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Ms. Owenze. Thank you. I think cell phones are critical these days when you've got double working parents and they have to relay messages and sometimes critical family issues to the students, so I don't want to see them taken away. I want to see them put in the backpack during class time, but in between, they should have access to know what, so they can be updated. And um, But it's a tricky question because you've got a lot of textbooks that require the use of iPads and other technology, even in the classroom. So a teacher's rule should be, if a teacher says we're using an iPad, fine. Teacher says we're using no technology, fine. There's got to be that respect between the student and the teacher. Um, as to AI, you know, there's always been the problem of people getting help from others. Now we're getting help from AI. That's something the teacher has to work out with the student in life. It's just getting more complex. <clears throat> Thank you very much to all of you. Um, Can I add just 
Sure, keep it to like 30 seconds, please. Keep it real short. My, my son has a learning disability, um, and the interesting thing with that is the technology has caught up to where his learning disability isn't a problem anymore. Uh, he switched from being on an IEP to a 504 because he said he doesn't need to come out of class anymore because he uses Siri for his spell check and he uses Grammarly on his Chromebook. And without the technology there, he would fall far behind the class. But because he has that technology there, he is able to be in honors classes and be A, B, sometimes C student, but he's able to strive and stay up with the rest of the classroom because the technology exists. Um, just you and nobody else. <laughs> yes, Ms. Prim, because you are a teacher, I will allow that. Thank you. Uh, it's funny that you had mentioned it because I actually got to take a trip to Washington, D.C. last year as a teacher uh, with technology going to the DOE and talking to the people who are involved in this. And they told us, don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of it. It is a tool, just like Google was when Google first started. And we just need to be able to, as teachers, teach students how to use it and use it well without abusing it. There are ways that it can be done, and we should not be afraid of it. And I say this as a third grade teacher whose kids you know, don't <laughs> have that kind of access. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, <clears throat> I suspected when I was asked to do this, I would have a whole bunch of questions like this. And I probably should have said, no, thanks. I won't moderate. But um, well, here we go. We're here to talk. So uh, I have a number of questions about gender identity. And I'm hoping we can address those in a respectful way. Please keep in mind that this is also being aired on public TV, if that's all right with you. We'll start with Ms. Whitaker and just work our way down. Um, I'm going to ask everybody the same question. How do you feel about allowing kids to use the pronoun of their choice? And should parents be told about this? All right. Here we go. The pronouns of their choice and should parents be told about this? Yes, please. Parents, you should already know if your child changed their pronoun. Don't expect the school to tell you that is something a parent should know. Um, and then after that, I think it's a personal preference. It's not, it's, it's not hurting or bothering anybody. Maybe it will help the other children to become more tolerant of people that are different. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, Ms. Giglio. Hi. Um, I do believe that the student should have the right to use the pronoun of their choice. Um, I think it's a matter of respect. Um, I think that it's similar to them asking to be called by a nickname versus their whole long name. Um, and I think that I agree with, with Kimberly that um, hopefully in a, in a family that's functioning well, these conversations have already taken place in the home and that it would not end up being the teacher's responsibility to inform the families of what's happening. Thank you very much. Mr. Johnson. I strongly support that. I mean, they, them, he, him, she, her. They should feel comfortable in class. And the fellow students in their class should be comfortable with that as well. Um, parents should be working with their students. If their students have these feelings and identify differently, then the parents should already know and they should be working with their students on how they want to live their lives. It is a personal issue with families, and, and it does go into the school. And the school has to respect the students and the parents. And you have to realize that that's the way things are, and you have to accept the children for what they are. Thank you. Ms. Prenner. And I, I agree. I really do. First, parents, I mean, if your child is uh, using different pronouns, parents should know. Uh, they should be working with their student before they even come into a classroom. And it is a person's civil right to use the pronouns that they choose. We, uh, I personally have had several students who have transitioned and 100% have supported it. Okay, thank you very much. Ms. Johnson? Thank you. I hope that if our students are gonna use pronouns that the parents will be speaking with the teachers and administrators ahead of time so there won't be any discrimination or any problems in the classroom that they're all in agreement. Um, it's up to the parents and it's up to the students and speaking with the teachers to make sure that
that if they're using it, they're transitioning in the classroom and there won't be any problems. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bishop. Thank you. Um, I worry about the students that come from families that are not supportive of pronoun changes. Um, I think we can learn a lot from our students and our children now in that I haven't spoken with a single student who wasn't considerate, who wasn't welcoming, who wasn't loving, who wasn't accepting. I think we can learn a lot from the students that we have in our schools and how to support each other. If there is a child who does not feel safe disclosing their pronouns or maybe their gender identity to their parents, we need to offer them a space to feel safe and we need to make sure that they know that they're going to continue getting a quality education in the national school system um, while they're becoming who they're going to be. Thank you. Ms. Daniels Williams. I believe that it is that we should support our students with um, whatever choice that they're making, which if they choose to use pronouns, um, that they should be supported not only in the school, but starting at home. So I would hope that their um, home would be supporting them because that will help them be um, more well rounded. But I believe that um, there should also be a safe space in the school just on, from a mental health perspective. Thank you, Ms. Hohenze. Hi, I think respect is like the number one key. The teachers, the students, the fellow students. I'm concerned and worried more, I think in the classroom, people will be respectful. It's, it's between classes, after school, before school. That's when you worry about bullying. Pronouns are fine with me. They can pick whatever they want as the grammarian in me. I do get a little upset when you have a singular number child and they want a plural pronoun. But I mean, they may have trouble doing Latin in high school, but <laughs> it, it, that's just, it's just a side joke. It's not really an, an attack. Uh, well, thank you. I, I'd like to personally thank each of you for your very respectful answers. A lot of times people ask me, like, what makes Nashua a special place? And it's exactly this type of thing. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. And so since the whole room got a little, you know, chill in it when I asked the question, I figured we'd go to something a little bit lighter. And I'm going to ask each of you to answer the following question. Who was your childhood actor or actress crush? And we shall start again with Ms. Whitaker. Okay, I'm going for music because I'm not, I'm not a TV watcher. But I loved Eminem growing up. Very nice, thank you. Ms. Julio. I was convinced that I was gonna marry Paul McCartney and I'm still waiting. <laughs> Good luck with that, Ms. Johnson. Or Mr. Uh, Johnson, sorry. Congratulations. Yes. <laughs> so many posters, so many memories. Um, <laughs> Uh, one of my first questions would be uh, watching Different Strokes and seeing Janet Jackson show up and, yeah, just... Very nice. Next. Next. <laughs> Ms. Prim. Uh, I'm more of a music fan and my personal crush has been Bono my whole entire life. His wife doesn't agree with me, but, you know, I think he's great. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Johnson. I think it was Paul McCarthy with the Beatles, but as I got older, I really liked Jerry Seinfeld because I can relate to Seinfeld, you know, with the New Yorker in me. Thank you very much. Ms. Bishop. Oh, man, nobody can beat Jared Leto. His lean against the locker in my soul called life, I could still swoon right now. <laughs> Ms. Daniels Williams. I'm going to have to go with Denzel Washington. <laughs> yes. mm. Got a lot of oohs and ahs from the crowd on that one. <laughs> Ms. Hohense? That's a good choice. I like him. I never had a crush. I mean, I was a, pretty much a tomboy. I was kind of doing things and being with people. I didn't really have a crush, so. OK, Sorry. well, that's an acceptable answer, too. A little dissatisfying, <laughs> but uh, so I'll just um, reiterate, Mr. Johnson, what you said. Lots of posters. Yes, same generation. Um, Linda Carter for me, so. <laughs> I'm with you. Um, uh, so diversity. Nashua is a very diverse community. We are, by some measures, the most diverse community in the state of New Hampshire. Certainly that affects our schools, um, actually rather disproportionately. Um, so what do you think diversity brings to our schools? Um, how does it enrich our schools? 
How does it potentially harm our schools? And what challenges do you see around diversity that we can overcome? How can we overcome challenges of diversity? And I'll start down at this end with Ms. Hoenze. Okay, um, the biggest challenge I see, and I've speaking, spoken to friends that were ESL teachers, is how we teach English to these students when the teachers themselves don't necessarily speak the native language of the incoming student. But I think the diversity is great, um, especially the cultural aspects and the different sports that, that you know the different cultures bring to it and the different costumes, different, there's so much. It just makes for a richer community. It's great. Thank you very much, Ms. Daniels-Williams. I think diversity makes Nashua great. Um, I love the diversity here. Um, I don't see any problems with um, any diversity, but um, I, I see the benefits. I want, I want to focus on the good things that diversity brings to the city. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bishop. I think diversity is something that defines Nashua and makes us an amazing place to be. I think our challenge is um, within the school system is finding the correct amount of teachers that can speak in, in multiple languages to meet the needs of all of the students. Again, I have no idea how we're going to fix that problem except going outside of the state, finding more people, bringing them in, um, and offering more resources um, and educational opportunities for people who want to become more lingual um, is, that even, is that even the right word? The gods were like, that was not right, Jen. Um, but I, I think our diversity should be celebrated and we need to um, afford the opportunities for the school district to have the resources available to them to teach all of the students with all of their backgrounds. Thank you. Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Growing up in New York, we had diversity all the time because New York is a city made up of everybody from every country. So when I grew up, it meant nothing to me because to me, everybody was the same and we all hung out together. Moving to Nashville when I did, it was a little bit different. It was a small little town, almost like with a city. And we have grown into over 90,000 people. So people from all over are moving to Nashville with all different backgrounds from all different countries. And that's really great. In school, I agree with Ms. Bishop, we need to have more teachers that speak many different languages because we have a variety of people from different countries coming to Nashua, and we have to be able to service them. But other than that, this is what I grew up in, in New York, and it's nice to see, I guess, a little bit of New York in Nashua now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Prynne. Uh, actually, the diversity in Nashua is one of the reasons why I moved here. I've lived here since 2007. And I absolutely love the different communities in this city. It's, it's just wonderful, and I love seeing how it's growing. As for supporting students with diverse backgrounds, I don't think it's just a Nashua problem. I think New Hampshire in general really needs to work on training teachers to work with diverse students. Uh, I am a teacher in Massachusetts, and we are actually required to have a, what we call an SEI endorsement so that we are, as a teacher, and I only speak one language, but I have worked with many children who come to us from other countries, and we need to be able to support teachers that way here in New Hampshire as well. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Well, spending my 20s and 30s in New York, very diverse though. <laughs> no, uh, yes, um, I actually have a very diverse household because according to Ancestry.com, I'm 90% Irish, but my kids are, um, my wife is uh, Mexican-Danish, so we're very diverse right in the house. Um, as, as a coach, too, of different sports, um, it's amazing to work with the kids from different backgrounds and different ethnicities and, and have them come together as a team and work together to achieve their goals. And that's all we want from them. That's what we want to see. All right, thank you, Ms. Giulio. Um, I admire the diversity that we have, and I was a little concerned when I first moved here, knowing that my children would be educated in Nashua, because I grew up, fortunately for me, in the city of Cambridge, in a very multiracial, multicultural environment. Um, and when we first moved up here, there wasn't the kind of diversity. My children are now in the late 30s and early 40s. We didn't have the kind of diversity then that we have now. What I've seen happen in the schools is, is 
celebration of those diversities. Um, and I think that all of our children can learn from one another. Um, I think it is important that we continue to strive to meet the needs of all of our English language learners. And that is a problem, not just here, but we need to work on that. Thank you, Ms. Whitaker. All right, thank you for that question. Um, growing up in Nashua as a black girl, I was often the only black girl in my classes with my sister. And as a black woman, I walk around and there's diversity everywhere and I can only appreciate it. I love the schools. The only problem that I see with diversity in the schools is that there's no diversity in the teachers. There's no diversity in the staff. So if we can get to a place where we can change that and get some color in the schools with the teachers, maybe it will help the children that are from different countries and backgrounds to better um, relate and feel comfortable. Thank you very much. Um, I have another question now. This one is actually not from the audience. It's from the League of Women Voters itself. And they asked that I pose this to you. This is about local control. Um, versus state guidelines and mandates. What is the appropriate balance between local control over curriculum and materials, setting graduation requirements, and state guidance from the New Hampshire Department of Education? So what's the appropriate balance? I mean, we can start down this way and just work our way back down. Ms. Hosnay? I don't think it's a much, it's much of a balance. It's like there's certain state laws, there's certain regulations you have to find, you have to follow, and then within that, those guidelines, you have a little bit of uh, leeway in terms of picking your, your curriculum. So it's, um, it's not a balance between laws and policy. I think it's just we have a lot of local control. The state legislature is very mindful of the fact that they don't want to dictate things to the locals. And there have been things that are contested and they are overturned. So we do have local control, but there is some guidance in the state regulations. Thank you. Ms. Daniels-Williams. So I'm going to have to say um, that's one of the things that I'm going to have to learn more about, um, as I said, on the board. Um, I do understand that um, the curriculum is, comes from the state level to the local level, um, but, but I'm very interested to see how that works. Mm. All right, thank you very much. Ms. Bishop. Well, I think it's twofold because when we, when we have state mandates coming down, um, it creates an equity amongst the schools within the state, so we don't have schools that are outperforming other schools because they have more resources. Um, the challenge, I think, is, is when the state mandates changes or shifts in practice and then doesn't provide the funding to create those shifts and practices to hap from, from happening. Um, I think our administration, our teachers, and um, you know, our people who are, who are bringing in the curriculum, who are creating the policies, do a fantastic job at meeting the needs of all of the students in the district, but I think when we start um, bringing in other hands in the pot, if they're not going to be enhancing the amount of funding that we have and the amount of resources, they need to have a better realistic view of what our, what our schools can do. Sorry. <laughs> I don't think that's something you did. Just so I, you think, know. I felt like I was Jarrell Head right. from Superman. Like everybody listen. <laughs> Are you done with your answer? I, I, I get. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Johnson. Thank you. You know, Local control is very important, so we have a handle on what we're doing in our school. State can set the guidelines, but it's really the cities and the towns that control the, the curriculum. Because when you go, if you live in Ash, when you go from one school to the other, you want to make sure those curriculums are set in stone. It's almost like the federal government coming in and giving you mandates and telling you that you have to do X, Y, and Z with special ed and then don't pay you for this. So to me, Local control is very important. Keep the state out of it, other than writing like mandates that give us some guidelines. But other than that, local control is the most important thing. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Prynne? Uh, I'm going to agree with Ms. Bishop in the fact that I really do feel it does need to be a balance. I understand. It's funny. I have been reading through the New Hampshire curriculum guidelines and trying to compare them to what Nashua's were. And uh, they, they are pretty well aligned. And I, I just, as, as Ms. Bishop said, when they do have a mandate, they need to be able to fund it as well. They can't, 
you know, tell a district this is what you need to do and then just kind of leave you empty handed without the tools you need for, for any curriculum changes. Uh, and the same mandates come from, say, the federal government and the DOE, those things come down. They need to uh, be able to fund and support the teachers and the students as well. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I agree with what's been said so far. <laughs> Very good. Ms. Giulio. Um, I, I agree that, you know, that the guidelines come from the state and they're important. Um, however, I think that we need to have as much um, independence in our districts as, as we can have. Um, I also think that the districts share with one another so that we're not just all little islands in isolation. And, and if one district finds this great new curriculum, you know, we can brag about it, we can share it. Um, I do, I do, I am upset that the state does not fund our students even close to what we should be getting per student. And I also um, think that, that it's a shame that we're losing a lot of tax dollars to people who are sending their children to private schools um, and, and are not, it's taking money away from the public schools, which is not good. Thank you, Ms. Whitaker. I'm second in everybody's notion on the board so far <laughs> that there has to be a nice even balance between but as our own city, I mean our own state to mandate regulations, I think that will be beneficial to our students. But a guideline from the state would be necessary. Okay, very good, thank you. So I have one more very short um, get to know the candidate question. And then we're gonna take a five minute bio break. And during that time, if there's anybody in the audience that has a burning question that you want to see asked, please find one of the League of Women Voters volunteers and write that down on a card for us, and we'll try and get to that in the second half of the uh, debate or the, the, the conversation. So I'm going to just start with Ms. Hoenze with this really um, hardball question. What's the worst job you've ever had? <laughs> worst job? Um, I don't know. You'd make a job what you want it to be. I can't think of Oh, oh yes. Okay, yes, yes, yes. When I was about 16 or 17, I worked in a factory where you take bottles and you put them in and you put the ink on like your shampoo bottles with it. So it was just how fast you could do it. And then if you did too fast or they smudged, then you had to take them out and they, they did your counts. And it was a very strange job, but, but um, it was only one summer. Well, that does sound terrible. How about Ms. Daniels Williams? Um, so my, my worst job, I think I've learned something from every job that I had. I think that um, when, I, when I was younger, um, I worked, um, I don't know. Like I don't think I don't think that I've had a, a bad job. There's something that I haven't liked about um, many of the previous jobs, but I've learned something from each and every job. Fair enough, Ms. Bishop. So I was one of those um, obnoxious newspaper girls when I was in <laughs> junior high, and I, I wasn't even the official newspaper girl. I would fill in for my friends when they would go on vacation, and I think that's even worse to like volunteer to wake up. At in the morning when the newspapers are delivered in front of your house, load them up on a bike and bike around a hill and throw out the Sunday paper to, for tips you weren't even going to make because you were just being friendly to your friends. <laughs> but it was heavy and it was cold and it was poor working conditions because I was my own boss. <laughs> Very good, Ms. Johnson. I think you didn't have to worry about your hair frizzing, right? <laughs> I didn't much care about that. I, I think so. I think so. I think the worst one was I was 21. I was living out in Yuma, Arizona, and I was cleaning apartments. I didn't find that very interesting or very great to do, but it gave me some money, so I did it before I came back home. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Prynne. Uh, I grew up in a really, really small town in Maine, so the events of last night are kind of echoing with me, but I grew up in a farm town, and before I was old enough to get a real job, I worked in the fields picking strawberries sometimes, sometimes green beans, and you would get, I think it was like 25 cents, 
you'd get like a dollar for a peck. It was not much money. And it was literal, like standing out in a field, picking things when I was like 13 years old uh, for days on end, just to make some fun money for myself, because there was nothing else around to do. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. I am self-employed now, and there's a reason for that. <laughs> <laughs> Been through several jobs. I, I will share. There was uh, I was working at Estee Lauder in New York, and um, it was it was a tough job because we were in a closet doing design, designing makeup in a closet was not fun. But um, on my final day, I was asked to leave, and I said, on that day they had given out free handbags to everyone. And I said, well, I'm not leaving without my handbags. <laughs> Good, Ms. Julio. I've had three very diverse careers in my adult life, and I've loved all of them. But prior to that, when I was um, going to UMass Amherst, where I got a wonderful education and I'm still in touch with all my roommates, um, I worked in the dining hall in the basement scraping garbage off plates. People did not finish their meals. And having grown up sitting looking at cold mashed potatoes and cold because in my house, you were always told that there were children going hungry somewhere else. And if you didn't finish your food, you know, it was like a sin. And then I would see all of this wasted food just going right by me. It was terrible. Thank you for sharing that. Ms. Whitaker? <laughs> um, so I've always worked with children in my career as um, jobs. But recently, I tried to do a little something, step out of the house and get out. And I worked at a pharmacy. And that was not for me. Um, <laughs> You, you, there's too much details that you have to pay attention to, and I'm a chatter, so it didn't work out. It didn't work out. We will be ending on time, so um, we have about a little bit less than an hour left. And one of the audience members actually pointed out something to, which, to me which I thought was a very fair piece of feedback, and that was relative to the redistricting question. That is a very important question, and I really did only give half of the uh, candidates a chance to um, respond to that. Just weren't sure how the timing was going to go and stuff. So let's still ask that question again, but this time this half of the table, starting with Ms. Johnson and working our way back, if you don't mind. So it was really, what, do you, what are you going to do to ensure that elementary redistricting results in equal access to classes across the district and or your feelings about the reconstruction and rehabilitation of Mount Pleasant Elementary and or is consolidation inevitable or all of the above? And we only have one minute to answer. You only have one minute to answer this, but talking, your you know? time is already going out. Oh, OK, we don't want to do <laughs> Given the fact that when we decided to build that new middle school, for some reason, they did not take a look at the population that it has been decreasing for many years. Unofficially, we're down to 9,920 students. The question is here with Mount Pleasant. I was going in to vote to close it that night, but I changed my mind that night when we were talking about it. I think that we need to give that school a little bit more of a chance. I think we need to know exactly what the numbers are and how to renovate it. And what we have to do is we have to take a look at where our population is decreasing. Mr. Preston said that we can close six schools. I'm not voting to close six schools, but I think we need to take a good look at what's happening in the district. Why are we losing so many students? And if we had a closed Mount Pleasant school, I've also said we can, maybe we should make that into a community center, just like we have at the Arlington Street. Did I do that in one minute? Good, there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Bishop. Redistricting is, is a, very complex, um, a very complex topic that we've been talking about a lot. Um, I think at the time that we went in to, to have that vote is, I mean, obviously you all know how I voted, which was um, to consolidate, but I think what I was in support of is that the teachers all had a place to go and all of the students were still within walking distance to other schools. Who knows what's going to happen in the next two years? I think people can either lean on what, um, what Preston Smith said, which is our enrollment continues to decrease, but with the additional um, apartments and housing that are being created downtown, we may have an influx of students that we weren't accounting for. <laughs> However, it is a big investment. We do have a lot of responsibilities within the school. We were just talking about the need for the ESL teachers, the need to make sure that the students with diversity have all of the educational opportunities that are available. 
um, and we need to be making uh, you know, state and local requirements in regards to curriculum. And I support funding everything. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Daniels-Williams. So when it comes to redistricting, I feel like that we will have to trust um, the professionals. We'll have to trust the numbers. We will have to um, stand with um, the choices that have already been made and going forward we'll be able to make um, decisions together. I also just hope that we don't have to close any schools. Okay, thank you. Ms. Hohenze. Redistricting. I, I don't see that we should just close an elementary school before we do some research. Right now, the district sends a couple hundred students, special ed students, out of district by bus, transport, some over state lines for special ed courses. When they were doing the middle schools, we proposed, and it went nowhere, but I'll propose again for the elementary schools, why not hire some special ed te teachers and be a destination in Nashville for, say, Hollis, Hudson, Plastow, so people don't have to drive so far for the special ed, only when it's cost effective. Maybe you'd start a few classes one year and a few more the other year. Maybe we have a use for that building that would be a win-win for both the students staying in district and saving money. Thank you very much. Um, Going to go in a little bit different of a rotation this time. So we kind of spread it around. We'll start with Ms. Prynne, work our way down, and then just loop back around, okay? So I will preface this with having a child who works in the Nashua School District. This is often on my mind. So I would like to talk a little bit about gun violence and your thoughts on how do you, this is the exact question, how do you plan on addressing gun violence in our schools with staff training and safety in those situations? This is kind of a, this is a tough question for me right now. I'm going to admit right now, I, uh, I had family members in Maine I had to stay up late last night making sure my mom was home and uh, an old high school friend of mine was killed last night. So um, something to me is very, I know I bring up what I do as a teacher. I have been trained. We have what we call Alice drills. I would like to take a look at what is done here in Nashua to keep kids safe. How are the kids being uh, taught to deal with intruders, what is the security at the schools. We have to, in my building, we have to badge in, badge out. I feel the kids are very safe, um, but there's always, there's always something more that can be done to protect kids. Um, I would like to see what they do, what they do for uh, drills for active shooters, for the teachers and the students, because um, I'm not quite clear as a parent, and I think parents, kind of need to know that too. Thank you and sorry for your loss. Mr. Johnson? Uh, yeah, I mean, I was on the PTO at uh, New Searles when um, Sandy Hook happened and um, we definitely were very involved in making sure to take the steps um, for added security, for um, we um, brought in the Nashua police to talk to parents about it. And, um, and it's a world our kids live in. Um, and they, 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 unfortunately, they know it. And they know what they, you know, they've been taught these things in class. They go through the drills. Um, you know, you, you can't walk into a school anymore. You have to, you know, buzz in, you have to go through the main doors, you know, at the high schools, you can't sneak in a side door. And, and kids do get in trouble when they slip a side door open to let somebody in. So, I mean, unfortunately, they're very aware of this and um, we just have to keep them aware and work with our police department to keep them safe. Thank you, Ms. Giulio. I've been in education long enough that I taught before Columbine. Okay, so I remember what it was like before we had any of these drills. Um, I also, after I retired from the middle school, I taught at, in 2016. I have long-term library subbed in three of our elementary schools, so I've been actively involved in the past few years with the drills right in our schools. They are terrifying, they're necessary, and we are doing everything we can. 
our society has to do something to get these horrible weapons out of the hands of the people that are getting a hold of them. And I, I, I have a grandson who now, before he goes to play at different friends' houses, his parents need to ask, do you have weapons in the house? Are they secured? That isn't anything we had to think about when my kids were little. I think that uh, the violence in our society right now is terrifying. Thank you. Ms. Whitaker. Um, I definitely agree with you. Um, as a former um, school employee, I do feel that our children are safe. Um, all the schools are for lock, knocks, knock, locked down. Um, and that makes me, as a mother, feel comfortable. Um, they are training our children um, for active shooter and everything like that. And although it's appreciated, uh, I don't want to say it will, I don't want to be the it will never happen to me type person, but I don't want to enhance it and scare the children like it could happen or anything like that. So the measures that we're taking now and what we have in place, I think are good. Thank you. Ms. Hohenze. Thank you. For the four years I was on the board, we did a lot in terms of security. Um, I know it's a very big problem, um, but we did at you know, put locks on doors, double up windows, put um, safety glass in there. They didn't talk about it. They, we met sometimes in private so that the public wasn't aware of all the safety features that we were putting in. We got funds and grants from the state periodically, and we did a lot, as much as we could, um, to enhance and upgrade the safety in our schools. It's a difficult question. Um, fortunately, we haven't have had you know, any incidents in the, in the district. But it's not because we're not aware that it could. It's, we're doing what we, or the district was doing when I was in there as much as it could. Thank you. Ms. Daniels-Williams. I'm also very thankful for everything that the district has put in place to keep our kids safe. Um, it is a very secure system to get into the schools here in Nashua, um, and that came from the planning. Um, so I, I'm very satisfied with everything that has been done and continue to look forward to um, teaching the students and the teachers more of what has to um, be done going forward. Thank you. Ms. Bishop? Um, tough, tough question after last night um, with, with, the, with the shooting up in Lewiston, Maine. Um, School shootings have become far too common in our society. The casual violence that we see on TV and in video games is a little ridiculous, um, but it's also, I feel that our schools are safe. I have no concerns about my kids when they're in there. They're badge in, badge out systems. We have um, you know, the tempered glass and we have safety in place. I think it's absolutely abhorrent that we have a state that doesn't have a law that says that anybody can just walk into schools if you're not staff or students with a gun. If we want to ensure our school and our student safety, we need to be looking higher up at who are going to make these regulations. People shouldn't be able to walk in with any kind of weapon strapped to themselves to come to parent-teacher conferences. If we want to make any kind of changes in regards to our school systems, we need to be looking higher up. We need to be having regulations on who can have guns, who are they can bring them, and certainly at the smallest factor is say that we cannot have guns in our school by anybody. Thank you. Ms. Johnson. Thank you. First of all, we have an excellent security staff here in Nashua. Um, we get briefed and non-public every so often, so I don't want people to think we don't know what's going on, but we can't talk about it because you can't let your secrets out. The other thing is, it's not so much that we're worried about an intruder coming in, it's that student that brings that gun to school that the parent doesn't know that straps it on them because they have a grudge against somebody and they start shooting up. So that's what we have to look at. We don't want to put metal detectors in there that tells us if there's anything coming on that person, but that's usually, it's somebody in the school. It's a sad thing and we don't look at it and I guess some of this comes out to we don't look at it as mental illness with this. Um, being that I work in retail, we always get briefed on active shooting and what to do in case somebody walks into a store and they start shooting up. It's the same thing in our schools. Where do you take cover? Where do you hide? What do you do? And I have confidence in the system here that we're protecting our students. You can't get into the building unless you get buzzed in now. And 
so we can keep our students safe. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I'm just going to stick with you, Ms. Johnson, and we're going to just work our way back around this way again. So um, sticking with the light-hearted topics, uh, what are your thoughts on the banning of books? And <laughs> should our children be exposed to all of our history, both good and bad? Oh, absolutely, because history repeats itself if we don't know about everything. I, I for one, am not in electronics that great because if I can't read it on my computer, and I have to print it. To be honest with everybody, I ask for my, no, my packets in paper because so I can write all over everything. Some people can do electronics. I'm not that big of an electronic, but we do do Chromebooks in school. But I think that we should have books. Kids should be able to read books in school, the paper books, so they have a little bit of everything. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bishop. Oh, we're going this way. Yeah, yes. Yes. <laughs> I, we're going. I was like, I'm, I'm going to think hard about this question. I'm implementing feedback in real time. Yes. So, um, I, book banning should be up to the parents. It, it's, it's not something that the school needs to come in and say this book isn't allowed to be taught in school. I think our history needs to be taught in its most accurate sense. Um, I think that our history is storied and it's troublesome and it needs to be honored because there are people who are um, people who are silenced by are not accepting the history that we have and by learning about it like Ms. Johnson said we can prevent it from happening again but we also honor the stories of everybody in our society thank you Ms. Daniels Williams I like that word honored um, I think that when it comes to books um, they all tell a story and it's important for our kids to know the stories to um, know the history, the dates. Um, so I think that it's very important that we honor um, the history that makes us all who we are today. And I think that that's very important and I don't want to see that taken away from the kids, the children, our students. Okay, thank you, Ms. Owens. I think we shouldn't be banning books so much as balancing, making sure we present all ideas but parents do have the right to opt out of any book or materials that they find objectionable state law. And the state can't mandate um, what you can do in the school. So there's a lot of latitude at the local level, but as a community, we want to respect the diversity and we want to not offend certain groups. So we want to put it in and maybe give a choice. You read this book or that book. The teachers will figure it out. Um, it's about respect, respect of the various cultures and respect of the history, which history is his story, his story, her story, their story. There's a lot of stories. The more stories you get, the more of a balance you're going to see of, of what actually happened. Hey, thank you, Ms. Whitaker. Mm, so I counter that question with a question. Who's banning the books? Who gets to decide what books are to be banned and what books are too much or too little for our students? So I disagree with banning books and instead maybe bring some other books from deep down and give some more culture that we've been missing for so much time. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Giulio. Um, as a retired school librarian and a member of the American Library Association, we are opposed to banning books, okay? And I agree with that. However, as a school librarian, I, I had, was able to help children select books that met their needs, their interests, and their, their reading levels. Um, and I always respected parents who would send a book back and say, you know, I think this book is too mature for my child or whatever. Um, if, if a parent, there's a, a system in our schools where if a parent has a, finds a book in the school library that they think is objectionable or should be taken off the shelf, there's a very lengthy process for them to go through to get that to get that to happen. Um, and the first step of it is that they need to read the entire book. Um, <laughs> and honestly, the few challenges I've had, we've lost the people at that point. <laughs> Thank you for that, Mr. Johnson. We're in a library, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, books should not be banned. Um, kids need to read what they read. My whole generation read Stephen King way too young. 
And um, we've all dealt with the trauma of that since. Um, so no, it, books shouldn't be banned and you should allow your children to read at the level they want to read at. I, I have a friend who's had a book banned um, because there's um, gay middle school characters, which is, which is yes, Rain, <laughs> yes. Which is, which is ridiculous. I mean, it, it's not sexual, it's friendships, and children should be allowed to read that and you know, see what life is like. So no, no banning books. All right, thank you, Ms. Prin. As a classroom teacher and a total book nerd, I'm very much against banning books. The, the comment I made a minute ago about was it Raina is he is friends with a famous children's author who's written some graphic novels that I love and have in my classroom currently and recommended to so, so friends. Um, we need to have rich, diverse materials for children to read, to be able to enjoy, to reflect the cultures that they come from. Uh, they need to be able to see themselves in this literature. They need to be able to see that. And as far as teaching history, it needs to be accurate. As, as Doris said, it's history. The word history is his story. We need to teach them accurate facts. We need to teach them the facts of what happened in history. Uh, thank you all. Um, I'm going to start with Ms. Whitaker. Uh, sure, Ms. Julie. Could I just have sure. 15 seconds? Sure. Okay, I got so involved in the book banning that I forgot to talk about the history part of it. And, and we need to teach our kids history exactly as it happened. They need to know the past so that we can live a better future. Sorry, I left that out. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to start with Ms. Whitaker and just work our way down this time. Uh, let's talk about charter schools a little bit and investment in voucher programs. So this is a question from the league. What is your view of the role of charter schools in public education? And what do you think about the use of vouchers? All right, so Rose, I'm gonna be transparent today. My <laughs> oldest son did try a charter school and it lasted, what, how long Ms. you wanted? Two, three weeks? No. Um, I'm, if you wanna, the National Public Education is meat and potatoes. There's children, diversity as we spoke about. There's um, things that are just already put in place. I'm a huge advocate for public schools. So um, if you're gonna go to, if you wanna send your child to a charter school or a different school, I definitely think it should be on your own dime. So um, no vouchers there. <laughs> Thank you, and I would ask the audience, please, to um, thank you very but much. But thank you all very much. But thank you, and, you, and I, we know how you'll Last be voting, one. but that's okay. So, Ms. Giulio. Um, well, I mentioned this earlier, and, yeah. and I think that um, in the past couple of years, the amount of our tax dollars that have gone to help people send their children to charter schools, private schools, parochial schools, keeps increasing to the point where um, people who could well afford to send their children to these schools are now also being able to get reimbursed with our tax dollars, which I think is absolutely wrong. Um, but I also think that there is a place for some children in charter schools. Some of them have a really clear focus either on technology or on the arts. And I think that there are children who thrive in that situation. Charter schools do not have to have certified teachers. They do not do state testing. So it, you are, I am a proponent clearly of public schools. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Johnson? Uh, full disclosure, I did a logo for a charter school in Nashua. <laughs> um, I do not feel that our public school money should go to charter schools. I understand the value of charter schools. I understand being an artist that some kids need that specialized learning that charter schools offer. But charter schools are supposed to exist as separate from the school system, but still involved, yet they have to be funded from other places, not from the school funds that we need for our public schools. Um, same thing with private schools. I understand some kids get a great education from private schools. I know a lot of kids who go to Bishop Girton and get a great education, but those fundings need to not come from our funding for public school. All right. Thank you, Ms. Prin. Yeah. Again, again, I can echo the sentiments of the other people is that I understand the need for uh, school, some kind of school choice only in the sense that we have diverse kinds of learners. Kids are diverse learners, 
but that money should not come from public funds. I would love if within the school district, you know, teachers were allowed to try different methods and materials to kind of meet the diverse needs of learners uh, instead of uh, having like a charter or a private school. Definitely do not think that uh, public funds should be going to uh, private schools. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Charter schools and private schools have their purpose have for certain students that need it. Um, not every child thrives in a public school system. And back when our schools were more populated, parents wanted their students, their children, more in a, in a charter school because the classrooms were smaller and they could meet the needs of their, their children better. Over the years, and where the state funding has been dipping more and more, and we've been asking taxpayers for more and more dollars, I think we need to go back to the state and say to the state, is this really working now for the betterment of our students in the public school system? And does things have to be changed and, and redirected in the funds? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bishop. Yeah, I, I have to agree with what everyone else has already said, is, is public school dollars should stay with public school educations. Um, with that said, there are, there are children whose needs are met within the charter school system mm -hmm. because of their ability to, to create a different kind of educational experience for them. I would love it if our school system was able to provide those same kind of experiences for children within our district, using teachers that are certified in buildings that we have, um, using money that we have, and um, you know, celebrating and supporting parents and students who, who may want to step away from mainstream public school, but within our umbrella of public school education. Ms. Daniels-Williams. I too want to agree with the panel, public um, education funds should stay for our district and fund our students to go to school. I've had the opportunity for my children to go to charter schools, and I'm not saying that it's not a good education. What I'm saying is that Nashua has a great education, and that public school it gives them a community, it gives them people in their neighborhood. It, there's just so much more to a public school that I think that as much funds for the public school should stay in the public school so that they can have um, music and they can have art and they can have sports and they can just be productive, well-rounded students in our public schools. Thank you, Ms. Owens. I'm not a fan of charter schools. They're public charter schools and I think they do have to take state testing as a public school but I don't like it's taxation without representation. There's no elected board over the charter schools and there have been problems in Manchester over some of the charter schools and, and how they're run. So I just think it's a really bad structure. I wrote a bill that um, I'm trying to, to work on with the state legislature maybe you know, in the future, but I'd like to see every public school, every school building could potentially be a charter school, have a little bit more flexibility, still stay within the district, not divide assets or liabilities, but somehow to give that mission, that, that little change to the school that makes it either music, art, dance, whatever, science, whatever that community wants, I think that would be great. The voucher program, I think, is even worse because, again, it's no tax, it's taxation without representation, and it risks the independence of private schools with the regulation. Thank you. Um, I appreciate all your answers. So, uh, but they were all very similar. Yeah. So I decided to pick a differentiator, um, and and keep in mind that these are the people who will be voting. So, if you could eliminate one food so that no one person would ever be able to eat it again. What would you pick to destroy? And we'll start down at the end with Ms. Whitaker. Oh, okay, that's easy. Definitely 100% liver and onions. Oh. Right? You're killing me. You want to clap? All right, again. Ms. Giglio. Okra. Okay, Mr. Johnson. Kale. <laughs> Ms. Bryn. I'm on the liver, I don't like liver either. Yeah, no liver. All right, Ms. Johnson. That's, I agree with them, that's gross liver. <laughs> okay, Ms. Bishop. If you ask my kids, it's anything I spent more than 10 minutes making. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Daniels-Williams. I'm gonna have to say um, squid should go away. 
I don't like squid, but if I could deliver an onions for everyone on this board, you would eat it. I would cook it southern style with gravy and onions, smother it down. Sold, Ms. Owens. I would say lima beans and Brussels sprouts from when I was a kid, but I've grown to like them. I don't know if my taste buds have gone, but I actually like all vegetables. A lot of controversy here, let me say. Um, now, the next question, and we're just going to start with Ms. Print and work our way around this way again like we did before. I don't know this to be a fact, so we're going to pose this question as if it was actually a fact. The question reads, a proposal to eliminate honors level classes at the middle schools will be brought to the Board of Education soon. Now, let's just assume that that's a fact. The question is, would you oppose or support this proposal? Why or why not? I mean, if there are kids that can qualify for honors classes and want to take them, I don't know why we would eliminate them. I mean, there are some kids who may want to excel. I was that total nerd. I would have loved that in middle school. I never had that opportunity, but there should be no need to eliminate it. All right. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, kids learn differently. They learn in different ways, and part of that is having those kids who are honors level be able to learn at that level and the kids who are not to learn at that level. They all get the same education. If you group them all together, the teachers often have to focus on, you know, the kid who's struggling the most, and sometimes those kids who really should be at the honors level aren't getting the education they deserve. Um, okay. Um, I believe that there should be honors classes because there are students who really thrive on math or some form of science or maybe French, um, just as there are students who really need our music programs, our art programs, um, our athletic programs. And I think that the more we can do to engage those students in something that excites them, the better education we're offering them. Thank you. Ms. Whitaker. I absolutely believe that we should keep honors programs. Um, kids that are in honors classes should be celebrated in those classes, and it also keep our students from going to other charter schools. <laughs> I think that we should keep the honors class. It's not just the level at which they're working, it's the pace. Honors classes usually work at a faster pace, and it's not fair to take a student who even is at the same level and maybe can't keep up that pace. So I, I would be opposed. Okay, very good. Ms. Daniels Williams? I'm gonna second everything that everyone said. Um, so far, I really believe that if a child has worked hard enough to get into honors class that we shouldn't take it away, it also will, um, help them going forward into the next grades to be um, proficient in the things that they have learned. So, yes, keep honors classes. Ms. Bishop? So, I agree with what you all are saying in that we should teach the students in the fashion in which they learn best. I would counter that with, with what makes an honors student. What makes their learning different from a student who takes a little bit slower to learn. Why would we need to separate um, children into honors because they learn easier and more efficiently than a student who may learn a little bit slower and needs a little bit more guidance? I think by labeling a student an honors student, we're automatically making other students not honors students. And we're not honoring the way that they're learning. And instead of saying they're honors students, have them be in classes where they need less um, teacher support where there are other students who need more teacher support. Let's pair the student with their learning need and then they can learn most efficiently and in their best, in their best fashion. So I think maybe not saying eliminate honors classes, but let's teach all students in the best way that they can learn. Thank you. Ms. Johnson. Thank you. I never believe in lowering the bar. I believe in raising the bar for all our students. And every child should have the same opportunity. Some might learn a little bit slower, some might learn a little bit faster. But you know what? Even if you don't name it honors, keep that bar high for our students because they, they can excel. I used to say to my kids, you can do anything you want in life as long as you put your mind to it. And that's what we have to teach our children. It's not about failing, it's about winning. 
and keeping that bar high. And if you expect them to do it and you teach them, they can reach that high bar. Thank you. All right, thank you. So um, this next question is about dollars. And as a person who runs a nonprofit, I appreciate this question. What would you do to increase grant applications and grant funding for the Nashua School District? Specific ideas that you would have. And we'll start, maybe we'll start again with Ms. Johnson and work our way back around this way. What we need is a full-time grant writer because we don't have one right now. We had a part-time grant writer and the city took our grant writer back. And the grant writers, if they're a good grant writer, they can find a lot of grants and they, doesn't, they don't really even have to get paid, they can get paid out of the grants. So that's where our downfall is. We need a full-time grant writer and not share it with the city because we can bring that person in when we need them, but you know what? We need them now, not tomorrow, next, next day or next year. So I would say we get a full-time grant writer. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bishop. I think in addition to the grant writer position, which, which we've been wanting for quite a bit of time, is also a team to manage the grants and the data collection that needs to come in and be resubmitted to continue to get the grant funding. Um, writing grants, managing grants is a very complex <laughs> job. Um, and I, I think one person writing the grant shouldn't be the same person who's managing the grant. So not only do we need to have a grant project manager, we need to have somebody who's going to be overseeing um, exclusively all of the data and the, the, um, the, the data and the research that needs to come along with how we're using grant funding. All right, thank you. Please. I agree with Ms. Bishop. Um, I've written grants for nonprofits and it's, it takes a team. There's a lot of information that's needed. I think that a full-time grant writer here in the Nashville school system would be great. Yeah, the, we four years ago we put in, or the city asked us to put in a part-time grant writer with them. I think we had a part-time on our own, but I'm sorry that that went south. I mean. The grant writers pay for themselves and, and what work they will do. I also would like that there would be more feedback with the board because a lot of times writing the grant sets the pace for what has to be done and by the time you're accepting the funds, it's already hardwired what the district has to do. So I'd like to see more feedback with the board and maybe more ideas back and forth so we can build that, that effort as a team. Thank you, Ms. Whitaker. So, I do agree with the panel, but I'm a person that likes to be a little different. So as I was sitting here, I thought of an idea. And what if we um, asked the teachers in our buildings within all of our schools who want to volunteer, people that might have those talents for grant writing, reading, and all that stuff to get together and make this, co this group that we need to write grants, not just one person, but a group of already staffed individuals. It's my idea. Um, I agree that we need a full-time grant writer for the schools, um, in addition to which um, the money that's, that the grants that are not written is just money wasted. It's just sitting there and, and we can do so much better than we are and, and that will meet all kinds of needs that are now unmet. So I think we need a full-time grant writer ASAP. Mr. Johnson? I think we've heard from all the incumbents of how important a full-time grant writer is to this. I mean, we see it, this is what they want, that's what we should strive for. Um, and I also think Ms. Bishop's right as far as there should be a team to oversee that and to look for those grants and to work on that. Um, and as well, cast a wide net, you know, look for teachers, look for students, look have everybody looking for grants so they can all feed it back to us. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit from what a bunch of people have said. I agree we need a grant writer. I know the town that I work in we do have a full time and it's made a huge difference in uh, getting materials for the schools. I also like Ms. Whitaker's idea of having teachers involved as well. Um, I, I apologize for talking about myself but I as a teacher have had the opportunity I actually was able to fly to Washington DC is this was part of a technology grant. Ironically, I went with a huge team of people from Massachusetts, but we had one person from New Hampshire. 
that was there. And uh, we were there talking to the powers that be at the Department of Education about getting money to schools. And that, again, this is kind of what spurred me to want to do this, is I want to be able to take what I've learned in my position and help here, help teachers, help administrators go to your, you know, your state representatives and the, the people in Washington, D.C. to get this money. Because it's there. You just got to get it. Thank you. Um, I'd like to revisit the conversation we just touched on earlier a little bit about um, gender when we talked about pronouns. I'd like to ask that question a little bit differently. It's, it's kind of a yes or no question, but you can elaborate if you'd like, but it's going to force um, a yes or no answer in any case. Should male students who identify as female have access to female spaces such as restrooms and locker rooms? And why don't we just start um, down at this end and work our way down, as Owen say? I think it's a liability. If anything goes wrong, the district is, will be responsible. So I, I would try to make sure that everybody is respected and everybody is safe. Those are my primary criteria. So, yes or no? No. Ms. Daniels-Williams? Yes. Yes, if a student has made the, 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 if the student has made the decision um, to fit into the gender that they feel most comfortable in, we should create a space for them to be most comfortable in themselves. Thank you. Ms. Johnson? I've heard so many arguments about this. My concern is, is the bathroom and the locker rooms. That's where my biggest concern is. Um, with that said, I would say no, only because of those concerns. And the irony is, is I was brought up as an only child, and I don't want to share a bathroom with anyone. But <laughs> <laughs> that was the question, <laughs> Mr. Johnson. Yes, um, because with even the realization that we currently have students mm -hmm. that use the bathrooms that they identify as, and it's it's not a problem. It's not an issue. It's only an issue when it's when it's made an issue. It's mm -hmm. it becomes you know information that's misinformation about these kids. Let them live how they want to live. Let them be who they want to be. Yes. Thank you. Ms. Julio? The answer is yes, but I think we need to look at the culture of every school and the comfort level of the people in the schools. And so maybe we need more accommodations. Maybe we need a girl's room, a boy's room, and a room. Maybe we need an additional locker space. Um, because I, th I think that all of us in, in the city look at this maybe differently than people in the small towns up north may, may view it. And I think we need to do what's going to keep our students the safest. Thank you. Ms. Whitaker, Ms. Whitaker is going with no. And um, I could back that up all day until I'm blue in the face, but I'm answering the question and I say no. I have just one more personal question for each of you, and then everybody's going to get the chance to uh, make a one-minute um, final closing statement, if that's okay. Um, so what is the most random thing in your purse or wallet at the moment? Uh, no. <laughs> oh, you guys, I change purses every day. I'm, I, it's the things that I don't have in here. But, oh, the measuring tape for my friend Jessica no, who left. Very good. Ms. Julia. Um, <laughs> mine are the reading glasses I have in my purse because I no longer need reading glasses, but I continue to carry them everywhere. <laughs> okay, I have a, a ticket from 2004, game seven, uh, Yankees, Red Sox. The problem is it's been in my wallet so long that it's completely white. You couldn't even read what's on the ticket. Say, I've been carrying a gigantic teacher backpack, but right now I actually have a, a packet about the science of reading. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Johnson. I uh, know, I was just looking in my purse to see what I have in there. I think it's my comb that I just carry to keep, to pretend that I'm going to comb my curls out. <laughs> they just sit in there. <laughs> Ms. Bishop, you cannot have the same answer. <laughs> oh, I don't comb my hair. <laughs> That would create a problem. Um, 
I have a deck of playing cards that I always keep on me because I don't always like to sit on my phone and be distracted when I'm waiting for things to happen. Sometimes I like to actually play card games with my kids when we're waiting for things to get going. Thank you, Ms. Daniels. I still have a paper calendar. <laughs> <laughs> I have a little jar, like a, a camera roll, where you put the you'll, you'll put the camera in when you're getting it developed, full of ibuprofen. Because whenever I went to athletic events and somebody got injured, somebody always needed ibuprofen. My kids are grown. I still have the ibuprofen. <laughs> That's pretty good. Thank you. Um, we have uh, enough time for everybody to make a one-minute closing statement. Um, I'd like to, before you do that, thank you for. The civil discussion this this evening. I think your the questions are a wide variety of questions from the audience. We do appreciate all of those as well as the questions from the league. Um, and thank you to the league for holding this conversation. We'll start with Ms. Owensay and just work our way down. Everybody has a minute to talk about um, to have some closing comments. Okay. There was one point that I'm bringing up from before. Part two, Article 28A says that your state can't mandate things on the local district unless it's fully funded. So that's something we have to keep in our arsenal. If we feel that the state is mandating something, we either just ignore it because they're not fully funding it or put a lawsuit back in there. Um, I would enjoy being back on the board. I think this is a great group. Um, I'm just here to see to meet people and to see if I can be useful on the board again. Thank you, Ms. Daniels-Williams. I wanna thank the League of Women Voters for inviting us all here tonight. Um, thank you everyone for being patient with me because I'm not a public speaker. <laughs> so, um, but I'm thankful for this opportunity to run for the Board of Education because I, I wanna make a difference. I wanna um, make sure that we support our kids so that they can be well-rounded, that the schools have everything that they need, and that we're supporting the teachers, the staff, and that's what the um, Board of Education does. So thank you so very much for having me here tonight. Thank you. I think we spent a lot of time tonight talking about honoring the, the different identities that we see within the schools, with the families, and within each of the school districts. I think we need to continue, um, continue on with that honoring streak by saying that we support every student in our district, learning the ways that they need to learn in, in areas that they're interested in. Um, we need to honor the teachers and the paraprofessionals and the staff that we have in the district and the amazing, wonderful work that they do by paying them accordingly, by giving them the resources and the professional development that they need to continue on doing a great job. We need to honor the history of all of our students. We need to honor the history of all of our Americans. We need to be teaching proper, um, we need to be teaching proper historical lessons and we need to be offering curriculums that are both accredited and um, evidence-based. We also need to, um, Give me the stop sign because I'll just keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> the hook, right? Yes. <laughs> thank you. I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for having us tonight. I'm asking for your vote on November 7th. Vote for Paula Johnson. I'm number six on the ballot because there's a Mr. Johnson here, but no relation to me. <laughs> I'm asking you to vote for me because I have experience, I'm fiscally responsible, capable of long-standing advocate in this district, and I'm here for the students and rep will represent them ongoingly. I will fight for parental rights like I have done before, and again, I'll talk about fiscal responsibility. I help make the schools a little bit safer with the air, with the Santa life coming in. Mm -hmm. I fought for that because of COVID so we can have hopefully cleaner air and try to keep everybody healthy in the schools. And again, I will ask those hard questions and I will look at the cost of all our programs. And I think together, whoever gets elected and hopefully three of us on the board, will, the incumbents, we can continue to work on the redistricting, looking at whether or not Mount Pleasant should stay open, renovated, and make sure our students are safe in this city. Thank you again. Hi. Thank you so much again to, for having us here tonight. I am a mom of two and an educator, and my passion is education. I know that may sound like a cliche, but it's really true. 
I may have mentioned at one point that I was one of those kids that when I was in the second grade, I knew I wanted to be a teacher. I really, I embrace it, I love it, and I want to, I want to give back. I want to uh, bring my experience to Nashua and help the schools become better. I mean, they're already great. I want to make them even better than they already are. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. It's great to see the crowd here and people at home. Uh, I'm, I'm number one on the ballot, so just make sure to. Um, I would like to end with a, uh, a personal note. A, a neighbor of mine, Alyssa Landsteiner, is trying to get girls ice hockey started at the high school level. Um, we are looking for people who have girls who even have the slightest of interest to, uh, to sign up. I will share the link on my uh, Facebook page, but please support the girls who want to play ice hockey on the high school level in Nashua. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Julia. I ask to be reelected because I want to continue to support a safe, nurturing environment for all of our students and our staff. I want to make sure that there's something for every student that makes them happy to go to school each day. Um, I, I have had over 30 years experience in public education. I still volunteer in one of our school libraries um, every week. And um, I, I think that starting off with COVID, which was the biggest challenge we had to the safety of our students, um, we actually um, have come a long way, especially in the last two years, and I want to continue to be on that path. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Whitaker. All right. <clears throat> I appreciate this opportunity being here with all of you. I appreciate all of those questions. Um, I felt confident answering them, so thank you for that. I also just want you to know about me. Like, I don't have a whole bunch of... Um, years of experience on any kind of board or anything, but I have 17 years of parental experience. I have experience working in the schools, special ed, regular ed, just education all around. So if you're looking for some new perspective, some new fresh blood to sit on this board, vote for Kimberly Whitaker. Thank you. I wanted to um, have everybody just give you guys a round of applause for, for such a great discussion this evening. Thank you again to the League of Women Voters. And just a reminder that next Thursday at 6.30 p.m. is their next debate, which is the mayoral forum, and that'll be at Nashua High School South. So 6.30 next Thursday, Nashua South, the mayoral forum. Hopefully we'll see you all there. Have a good evening and drive safely.